With the explosion of AI, it's becoming obvious that writing code is less and less of a bottleneck. So what's the new bottleneck? Design. Actually making the thing make sense and look good enough that people want to, you know, actually use it. Right now, most people are stuck trying to prompt engineer their way to good UX, or they're trying to force it through other tools like Google Stitch. But those methods pale in comparison to the workflow I'm about to show you. It bypasses those disjointed UI systems and focuses on one thing, helping you build beautifully designed products. They're backed by Y Combinator and they've come a long way since I first found them back in February. This tool is called Polymet AI and in this video, I am going to show you how to use it to create the best designs you've ever done. So if you're trying to make applications that look like a professional really built them, you really only have three options. Number one, you can actually design them by hand in a tool like Figma. But for me, that's not really an option because I am not trained as a designer. Number two, you can build some robust prompt systems that can take in inspiration, they can take in user stories, they can take in style guides, and they can help you build out something that looks really nice. This is usually my preferred approach because again, I have a lot of videos on my channel that are dedicated specifically to that. Now, option number three, you could try to cobble something together using a tool like Google Stitch, which again, I've done videos on, or a tool like Replit's Design Mode, which uses Gemini 3.0 to build stuff that looks kinda nice. Now, those last two options can work, but they usually leave you with a little bit of a sense of, ah, it's kind of good, but it's really not where I want it to be. So this tool that I'm going to show you today, Polymet, it's kind of like a combination of option one and option three. It gives you really granular control over what you're doing, but it still does a lot of the heavy lifting for you. So that being said, let's hop in and I will show you the workflow in a real app that I'm redesigning. Now, really quickly before we get started, they do have a free plan so you can try this out and see if it's something that works for you and that you like. They give you 250 credits, which will get you a few design generations of major screens and components of your app. From there, they have a $50 per month version, which I am on that gives you a lot more credits and it also allows you to export what you have built to React. Now, if you're trying to build something a lot more robust, a really big app with a lot of functionality, they have other plans that give you a lot more credits or even unlimited credits. Now, I have friends that have built entire functional wireframes and prototypes for their app using this $500 a month plan, so it is very effective. So that being said, let's start off with the first piece that I think makes this app unique, consistent themes and design systems. So one of the biggest pains I hear from you guys is that the systems that you use don't always follow the design guidance that you've given it. Well, Polymet helps us put that to rest by allowing us to create actual design systems that we can then apply to our apps. And the way we get started with this is pretty simple. So we can come over, we can click on new design system, and we can choose the option to use AI to build this thing. When we go to continue, we can give it a name. And then what we're going to do is we're going to enter into a very simple, natural language prompting type of environment. Now, I have a prompt that you can use here to take your app concept and any inspiration that you have and turn it into a system that is built on Polymet's best practices. So they recommend that you build a high level design system foundation to use with their tool. So all you need to do is copy this prompt, pop into Polymet paste it in, and hit go. Now, once this thing is done processing, this is the type of output that you're going to get. So everything that we need from our buttons through to our typography and everything in between that we gave in that prompt is going to be designed out for us. So for example, here, we're looking at what our primary button sizes look like, what they might look like with icons, for example, if we wanted to send a message, what different states of that button might look like, what it's gonna look like if it's on the background of a different card. Similarly, we get all of those things for our secondary button. So if it's not like a primary action, such as if we want to cancel something we're doing or download or share. And then as we continue to move through in this example, I was asking it to kind of clone Claude, but with a different color palette. And so we can see that it's giving us different demonstrations of what these different elements and design systems might look like together, what different inputs could look like, 
what a sidebar might look like, again, if we were cloning Claude. And it goes on and on, giving us different layouts and demonstrations of what this design system actually looks like. So once this is done, we have a full design system that we can use inside of our other PolyMet projects. So this is great because we don't have to worry about whether or not the model is going to actually use our design system. It's already built into how the tool functions. But now that this is done and we have our design system with our core components, the typography, the accessibility, how motion and interaction should work, now that we have all of this done, we can work on building out our actual app screens. So the way that we get started using this system is we go back to that home screen that we were on and where we have the option to start prompting this thing, we can now actually select our design system. So they have some built in public design systems that you can use, but we also have access now to this design system that we actually created. And so if we select this and then go in and give our first prompt, it is going to build out those screens with our project design guidelines integrated. So I've gone in and filled in a few of these prompts that I'm going to show you in a second, just so that we have something to actually look at to start with. Now, the best way to use this tool according to their own documentation is to prompt things out in chunks, meaning you don't want to give your entire project specification at one time. It actually works a lot better if you go screen by screen, giving it very small contained prompts. So what we're looking at here is a complete build sequence, meaning I have all of the UX that I know I want to build into this app outlined in phases. So what do I need to build first? What do I need to build second? And we move on and on through all of the different features of our app. Now, the way we kick this thing off to actually get all of those screens is by passing in our UX specifications. And we can look at those here where we're going through all of the jobs to be done inside of the app, how the information is going to actually be architected and presented to the user so that they're not overwhelmed with all of the different options. We have our nav structure. We have maps of how every screen should actually look and how the information should be nested. We have exact user flows, meaning if they want to take some sort of action, like in this case, create a new prompt. What are all of the different screens and modals that they flow through along the way? And what is meant really to take place at each of those stages? Now, if you want a walkthrough of how we go from a product concept fully through to all of the features that we're going to have, and then building out this type of UX doc from there, I have a free course inside of my group that I'll link below where we can get this type of granularity out of whatever your app actually is. But that would take too long for purposes of this video, so we're just going to show how you can actually use this to start building out really cool stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the next prompt on my list, and I'm going to go back into PolyMet. So if we were to look, for example, at one of these screens, so this is the prompt detail screen, it looks nice and it looks well-structured, but there's not a lot of nice interactivity. There's not a lot of those small details that really make this thing pop. So for example, if I was to click on this kind of overflow icon, nothing happens. If I click on the favorite toggle, nothing really happens. And so what we can do is we can come through here and I'm simply pasting in that prompt that we just copied. We're going to hit go. And then what this is going to do is it's going to move through the background. It's going to build a plan and is going to implement exactly what we asked for. Now, what we can see as this thing is moving through is that it creates the page that this is going to be displayed on first or views it. And then what it does is it goes through and it creates different components. So instead of putting everything in one giant view, it's actually considering what are the different components here and it's building those as contained elements. Okay, so now that that's done, let's look at what we did. Again, the point of this prompt was to add interactivity to this page. So let's go through and see what some of these interactive elements might actually look like. So you can see when we click on this icon, we get a nice little animation of the star filling and unfilling. Really nice touch. We now have this nice overflow menu that pops down. If we scroll down to the bottom, we can see that we have this copy content button, which now transitions state and shows that it copied. And again, this is using that button component system that we made earlier where we were specifying what something should look like when there's an icon there. We have this history option as well. If we click on this, boom, we get this really nice slide out option that is showing us 
what the different version history of this specific prompt in this case, because this is a prompt management and version history tool, what it actually looks like through time. And we can leave little commit messages about what we changed. So this looks really nice. And again, that was adding a smaller feature. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take two of the bigger features that we had. So the actual version history panel of a prompt and then the diff viewer. So the way that I built this app was that it's meant to be kind of like a Git diff where we can see what we changed in our prompt over time and then track how that impacts the quality of what we get out the other side. And so I'm going to go through, I'm going to copy both of these. I'm going to paste them into Polymet. And then when we come back, we will look at what it looks like to build something entirely new from scratch because that functionality is not in here anywhere. All right, guys, so we just let both of those prompts run through. And if we pop over into this history tab, we can see it did change the style a little bit because it had made this version history, but then I had a separate prompt that was also asking it to make that. So it looks slightly different. But if we were to now to go to like version one, for example, and hit compare, we now have this really nice looking side-by-side -side, uh, diff comparison. And so we can do it again side-by-side. -side. We can click on inline and see what the inline diff is. And then we can compare different versions. Now, the state would change here if we were trying to look at different versions, if we wanted to look at, you know, V2 versus V3 and so on. But again, really nice screen that we had developed. And this was super easy to do using this process. Now, what would happen if we wanted to actually make updates? Well, that's where the next stage comes into play, allowing us to make these really granular revisions. So obviously this thing isn't going to be 100% out of the gate. So what do we do in those situations? If we come up here to this select option, this is basically going to make any single element on this page selectable. So for example, let's say that in this left-hand sidebar, I don't actually like this hover state. So there was a previous version of the app where it had this bolded, like left aligned anchor point. That was a nice blue that matched the rest of the color of the app. And I want it to be that when any of these things are hovered over like this, the styling is a little bit more accented. And so I can come up here and I can hit select. And this is, again, it's going to allow me to select anything on the screen. And so I could come through here and click on this element. And then I'm going to be able to annotate it. So I could come through here and I could say, add a left aligned anchor element. That's a bold blue. Anytime one of these items is hovered, right? So I could save that and then I could move through and I could mark up anything else. So I also don't like the spacing between these list elements. So I could say, make the spacing among list elements more compacted feeling, right? I could save that. And then we could go through and we could go through obviously and make a lot of different changes to this. And then we could hit run revisions and it's gonna move through and it is going to make all of those changes that we've asked for. So in the case of this specific app that we're building, again, we have 50, I think, different prompts that all represent different elements, different components, different screens. And what I really love about this workflow is we have different manifestations of the actual loading state or different states that could be there. So what happens when it's empty? What happens when there's an error? What happens when it's completely full of data? What happens when it's, again, in the middle of loading or entirely empty? We're generating all of these different components ahead of time, and then we'll be able to just export them out and build the business logic of our app, which in this case I already have because I am redesigning an existing app. So we can see now that the space between these has definitely been compacted a little bit, which I think looks nice. And then as we scroll through these elements, we can see again that little left aligned bar that pops up. Uh, indicating that we're hovering over this, which I think it's one of those small details that makes it look really nice. And so this process would repeat. I could go through here and paste in one of my next major features, which is this actual knowledge base screen. And we continue this process again through all of those prompts that we have until we have a pretty functional prototype. So that's an again, another thing that's really cool about this app is they're not just different screens that aren't connected. We can actually move from all prompts into a prompt view. We could say that we want to edit it. It's going to pop up the actual edit modal. So it's, it's all integrated together into an actual prototype that we can walk through. So we've continued on with this process now, building out a few more things. So built out the knowledge base, really nice index screen. 
Uh, we click in there, we can see all the different entries that we have inside of here. Um, so overall, I mean, it's looking really nice. They even have a model for adding the, a new entry. Looking really nice. But what happens if we want to get access to all of this stuff so we can actually start building from it? If we come up into the top right of our app, there's an option to export it. And there's an option in there to export as a React app. So if you click that option, it is going to go through, it's going to zip up that project, and it is going to place it on your computer. So now we can see we're on our local host because we downloaded this thing, installed the packages, and then just hit NPM run dev, and it kicked this up in our local environment. So we can come through here now to our heart's content, mess around with the app, hook up all the back end, the testing, the business logic, the deployment, all of that stuff can now be configured on our local machine. So again, this is great. We have a functioning React app. It already has all of the Tailwind configurations set up inside of the app. And we can now move on to customizing this thing to our heart's content. So no more downloading stitch screens and trying to reverse engineer the HTML and JavaScript into React and Tailwind. It's all packaged for us already and ready to go. And it's a lot higher quality designs than you will get with most other tools that I have used. So it's a win-win if you ask me. So there you have it, a surefire way to build awesome product designs. Just remember, design and functionality go hand in hand. And so it's important that you go through from your features through to how those features are going to manifest and how people will interact with them. So it's important to make sure that neither of them are an afterthought. So now that you can make professional designs with the snap of a finger, thanks to Polymet, join the free group below and share what you have built. We've got over 14,000 people, and a lot of them have launched their own SaaS products. Uh, the community loves giving and receiving feedback, so hop on in. The water's warm. But that's it for this video. I will see you in the next one.